You know, last time that I remember that I had the privilege of speaking here, I think it was a couple years ago, I probably ended maybe five minutes early, and Mr. Ames came up to me and said I had 10 bonus points for ending early. So we'll see if I get 10 more bonus points this time. You know, years ago, when my wife and I were living in San Francisco, when I was attending the University of the Pacific in San Francisco, I remember one day hearing on the news on the radio that there was the typical commute that afternoon between San Francisco and Oakland on the Oakland Bay Bridge. And as it turned out, one car passed another car, you know, it was heavy traffic, and, and then hit the brakes as he moved in front of the car ahead of him originally, which irritated the guy behind him, but that's the way traffic flows sometimes. You can't control it. But the guy who had to slow down quickly passed, uh, got in the other lane, sped up, got in front of the car ahead of him, and hit the brakes. And, you know, kind of a chain reaction. Tempers began to build. There was irritation. There was offense. And finally, one of the drivers pulled up alongside the other driver, and through the window, he had pulled out a revolver, apparently under the seat, and shot through the passenger window, the driver on his right side. And he died on Oakland Bay Bridge. And you think, what an incredible experience of being offended to the maximum, of, of making a mistake that one paid for for the rest of their life. And again, one died as it was, and the other spent years, maybe the rest of his life, in prison. Sometimes we call that road rage, but it's a symptom of a society that typically, oftentimes, is very easily offended. Now, I know you and I, if we're led by God's Spirit, we would never be so highly offended that we would do such a thing, that we would express ourselves in that way. And yet, I imagine all of us, at various times of our life, have been readily offended, easily offended. We've said things we regret later. You know how that feeling is? You think, whoa, why did I say that? Or why did I respond that way? And of course, again, none of us would have pulled out a gun. That is, being led by God's Spirit, we wouldn't have. But I'm sure there have been many times when we have been readily offended, and sometimes some of the silliest of offenses, as it turns out maybe with a husband, a wife, an employer, or even another church member. Sometimes we're just simply too easily offended. And you know when a person is readily offended, easily offended, they're demonstrating a true lack of self-control. In other words, others control them. I'm sure it's, it's applied to all of us at various time. Lack of self-control, a higher level of self, centeredness, and of course that's exactly what the great God wants eliminated from our nature, from future leadership in the family of God. It's a crucial aspect of the very character of God. As it turns out, you know, you and I, I'm sure at times, maybe we've gotten in a little bit of an argument or a tiff about something, maybe we've been offended for one reason or another, and after it's all over with us, we finally realize, you know, the argument was about nothing. About nothing. It was, it was simply about the need to be right. Defending our honor, our ego, our, in a sense, our self-centeredness. The need to be right. And I remember that when I was in high school, watching various uh, students maybe argue a point. And it occurred to me, even as a teenager, that most of these guys were arguing just about being right rather than the principle they were discussing. There are other times when people are offended and they simply can't let it go over the time of months, weeks, I suppose years, whatever the case may be, and a relationship is ruined and oftentimes people withdraw. Sometimes they enter a mindset of avoidance. You know, I will avoid him or her because I'm offended. I've been offended. I was unjustly treated. 
Have you ever felt like you were unjustly treated? I think we all have. It's not a good feeling, but it, you know, ultimately, it's part of our training, I think, in this life as, as God intends in one sense. Being easily offended is something a future leader, of course, in God's family must overcome. That applies to all of us. That applies to me. That applies to every last one of us. Being easily, readily offended. What if as firstborn sons of God at the very beginning of the millennium after Christ's return, we run into offenses, and we will. There's not the, the right level of understanding and of respect and there's great offenses with the Earth's population. We know it will be following World War III and anarchy on the planet. The world's population rejects Jesus Christ and those with him. They're deceived. They're confused. Religion has deceived them. And what if that impacts us? They take it out on us and their misunderstanding. Do we reach out at that time and destroy those who are offensive to us? Of course, the answer is we, we won't, we can't. In sh if that were the case in short order, there would be no life left on the planet. If we took offense every time somebody was a little bit confrontational or in our face, we destroy life on the planet. You know, I think the intent is we will firmly establish control under Jesus Christ and in many cases be able to overlook the offense even though we're sons of God. At that moment in time, we've got a higher agenda. We overlook the offense. We don't necessarily take it personally and we help them realize we're here to bring peace, that we're on their side. We're here to help them see the way to a better life and a better future under the government of God. Well, we know, according to Jesus Christ, that offenses must come. Matthew 18, 7. Offenses must come. In other words, offenses currently are part of our training. And think about that. They happen. It's part of our training. If every time we were offended in this life, if every time the great God intervened immediately to protect us, to set things straight, and God intervened maybe kind of like the glass bubble over us and protected us from everything, in truth, we would lose the ability. We'd never have the opportunity to develop self-control, the individual, the mindset, self-control, and of course, God wants us to experience that need, be able to control ourselves, to not be controlled by others like puppets on a string, a tremendous char character trait of the family of God, self-control. Well, some would say, and I've sometimes heard this in various areas, that it's our duty to take offense when there's injustice. When there's injustice around us, it's our duty. Every perceived slight, every lack of respect to us, to our family, to the church of God, and every violation of the law of God. But if that was the case, God's intention for us in our training, you know, what would we do with certain inspired scriptures that imply a whole lot of self-control? a whole lot of peace, a whole lot of not being offended under circumstances. Psalm 119, let's turn to Psalm 119 in verse 165. God's word has a lot to say about that, about not being offended, about taking things calmly, about being under control. Psalm 119 verse 165. I'll read the King James first. Great peace have they which love your law. Personal peace. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. 
Interesting, isn't it? I mean, there is injustice, but nothing shall offend them. The New King James says it this way, and nothing causes them to stumble, to stumble. When we are offended, when we carry offenses and resentment, sometimes for many, many years, inevitably, there's bitterness, isn't there? It's the sense, I've been unjustly treated, I won't take it, there's bitterness towards another. And typically a relationship is ruined. And it's so, so common among men. And also Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 11. Proverbs 19 verse 11. It speaks of the discretion or the wisdom of a man. And it says the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, controlled, slow to anger, and his glory, at least as far as God is concerned, his glory is to overlook a transgression. You know, at times we may have been wronged. Our feelings may be hurt, but the great God, his word states that his training in this life particularly for the first fruits, those who would be first born, demands that we refuse to become offended, to grow bitter, to get even. It's not God's way. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we speak it, sometimes we speak it of, of that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, as the love chapter, or we could say the outgoing concern chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, speaking of love as the fulfillment of the very law of God. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, and it speaks of love. It speaks of outgoing concern. Paul's word said, says, in other words, love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Notice that is not provoked. Other translations render not provoked as not easily offended. It doesn't happen readily. There's a great deal of self-control, future son of God, outgoing concern for others, for the plan of God, the purpose of God, the agenda of God, not easily offended. There are approximately 75 times in the Bible when we find the translated English words offend or offense, the Greek word used most often is scandalon, S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N, scandalon. And it anciently represented a stick or a trigger in an animal trap. So a little bit of trigger that an animal would hit and the trap would slap shut. And when that scandalon in the original, that scandalon is bumped, the trap springs shut, and of course the animal's caught. Now think about that, the scandalon, of course, the origin of the word scandalon, you begin to understand, you begin to understand the implication that when one is offended in a significant way, they're entrapped, they're caught in a mindset that is contrary to what's good and proper in spiritual maturity, they're entrapped in a difficult mindset. And one, when one is trapped in a mindset of offense, it leads, it leads us away from God's intention for us, from his mindset. When we're trapped in offense and we grow bitter, sometimes we avoid, we take it personal, we jump to conclusions, and so it goes in life. Pretty typical, isn't it? And you know, this applies to marriage, obviously. It applies to brethren in the church. It applies to employment in the world and to every human interaction or relationship in life. It is true that there can be people who are offensive from time to time. They have offensive behavior, we know that, and, and that's a, that is a given. 
But the question is, how we respond is the real issue. It's the key to our training for God's family. How do we respond when even others are offensive? Today I'd like to look at that subject in a little more detail of being easily offended. We're going to look at some of the concepts of offense and secondly at ways to prevent us from taking offense. A key character trait being under control as the great God is himself. Title of the sermon, Be Not Easily Offended. Be not easily offended. And before I get into the main aspect of being readily offended, I, I do want to point out that the Bible is clear that we must avoid the other side of the fence. We must avoid causing offense. In other words, being the one that causes spiritual offense to others so that they potentially even leave God in his way of life. That's a very grave danger. We know that. There are some people who pride themselves in telling it exactly like it is, they say. You know, I don't sugarcoat anything. I tell the truth. I tell it exactly like it is. It's kind of like if somebody takes offense at it, that's their tough luck. I've heard people say, I say exactly what's on my mind. I won't sugarcoat anything. I just speak the truth. But well, we do need to speak the truth, but do we always need to offend? Question. Does this approach fit in with the following scriptures? Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Now think about that. The mindset that says, I always speak exactly what's on my mind because it's true. Maybe yes, maybe no. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. It encourages us to be kindly affectionate. Kind, kind-hearted, kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. And you, you get a feeling of a little different spirit here beyond I just say exactly what's on my mind. I don't care who it offends. I just speak the truth. Scripture says, be kindly affectionate, be concerned, considerate on how they may take it. And also, of course, Colossians. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and over to verse 12. Speaking of that mindset, it's slow to offend. I mean, that works towards peace. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Take it easy. <laughs> tender mercies. Kindness. Humility. It, humility, one of the great character traits of the family of God. Humility. You know, we understand our position. We, we're not greater than we think we are. It goes on to say meekness, long-suffering, you know, there are times one may be wronged and they take it patiently. They're long-suffering, they're patient, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. You know, forgiving, just as God forgives us. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And that's kind of a different take on the assumption by some that I, I just tell it like it is. I don't care how anyone takes it. I just speak the truth. Well, we always speak the truth. That's our agenda. But we don't always tell everything on our mind, do we? If we're going to be at peace with our neighbor, our brethren. So obviously, the I don't care who I offend mindset doesn't fit into God's plans for our development, for his family, today and tomorrow into the kingdom. That mindset will never be acceptable to the great God. It won't fit into the family of God. It'll never be acceptable to a husband or a wife or for that matter, a brother in Christ. 
Well, that's very clear. We're instructed to not be offensive. But on the other side of the fence, where I want to focus a little more today, on the parallel problem of being easily offended, of taking offense readily, you know, wearing one's emotions on their sleeve, that type of thing. If we are easily offended, it implies, when you think about it, that we're overly focused on self, on me, lacking balanced self-esteem, balanced godly esteem. There's too much focus on the self. We become more concerned whether we measure up in this life or not. It's kind of human nature, isn't it, to be ego-driven, to be concerned how others perceive us, whether we have enough honor and respect in others' eyes. Isn't that the essence of human nature, to be centered on the self? Self-centered. So what's the danger of being easily offended in this life? When we're easily offended, when we get our feelings hurt easily, we tend to lose control, and in the end, we lose. We pay a price. One way or another, we lose. I remember years ago seeing a security camera scene, a video, store parking lot, you know, cars are, are driving around looking for a place up close, and uh, there are two ladies, different cameras, I guess security cameras, two ladies both spot the same parking space in front, right up at the entrance to the store, and they both go for it, <laughs> not seeing each other, and one of them worms her way in ahead of the other who thought it was hers. And the car that doesn't make it, the uh, lady that didn't make it, is infuriated, offended. And she actually bumps the fender of the lady who parked first. And not leaving well enough alone, the lady who is already parked puts it in reverse and backs up. And needless to say, there was, before it was all over, there's quite a bit of damage. <laughs> How do you explain that? to the insurance company? <laughs> How do you explain that to your husband if you're married? You can't. <laughs> you can't. Well, the harm in that case is obvious. There's a penalty. There's difficulty when we're easily offended and we respond. But you know, in every other aspect of life, when we are easily offended, it brings harm to us one way or another or our loved ones over time. It absolutely brings harm. It applies to marriage relationships, family relationships, relationships between church brethren, and on and on and on in every human relationship. And quite often when people are easily offended, they withdraw. They withdraw and begin to avoid the one who seemingly offended them, who maybe slighted us, if we're prone to that. I think probably all of us to some degree. You know, I've looked at myself at times and realized, you know, I, I must not be readily offended. I must not take it personal. And when a person is offended, they cut off communication. It happens among church brethren. They jump to conclusions. They assume the worst. And it begins to ruin, potentially, a relationship, even in the church of God. An example. Assume for a moment that a husband and wife are going to a special occasion. Uh, you know, the wife spends quite a bit of time on her appearance and her dress, a lot of effort on her appearance. And the husband says, honey, you look beautiful in that dress. But suppose the wife retorts, oh, so I look good in this dress, but in every other dress I look plain. <laughs> you know, you get a little bit of the drift of jumping to a conclusion, of assuming the worst. You know, it happens. We interpret. We don't stop to find out. We're readily offended. Or, on the other side of the fence, maybe a husband comes home from a hard day hard day's work, 
he attempts to explain to his wife, you know, what a hero he was, all his accomplishments on the job, in the world, what he puts up with, and, you know, while filling her in, he notices that his wife is kind of like ignoring him. You know, she's adjusting the burner for the dinner, and she's to the side kind of interfering with the children's squabble. And the husband feels like, hey, I'm being ignored. And the husband yells, why can't you ever show an ounce of interest in what I go through at work? Slightly wrong interpretation, wouldn't you say? Jumping to a, a conclusion that wasn't meant, being easily offended, being overly concerned about self, as unfortunately, I think to some degree, we all are, at least we start out that way, and yet God expects us to change. So how do we keep from being easily offended? That's the key. How do we reverse course in our training as God prepares us for his family. I've got several points I want to illustrate. I think it's necessary that we take it personally in this life, that we begin to shift gears and realize that God wants to see growth in our life, not just support the truth and the work, but begin to change inwardly. We call that the internal work of God. First of all, number one, we need to realize that we may start out in this life easily offended, but it is possible with God's help to overcome. It's possible. It can be done. Being easily offended is learned. It's not genetic. You know, when you think about it, we don't have to be self-willed. We don't have to be thin-skinned. We don't have to stay that way, we can change. We're capable. Let me give a, a biblical example. I think it's good sometimes to realize, hey, in all the great men and women of scripture had human tendencies like we all were and have, but they changed. Mark chapter three. Mark chapter three and verse 13. And we see a time period here where Christ was choosing his disciples who would later become apostles. Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. We read an example here of some whom he chose. What kind of individuals did he choose? It says in verse 13, And Jesus came from Galilee to John at Jordan, at the Jordan rather, to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent it. I'm sorry, I'm in Matthew. <laughs> Let me try that again. Don't be offended. <laughs> Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. Okay. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. And then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have power, and to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, notice this, John and James, to whom he gave, them, he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Okay, now he chooses the sons of thunder. Now, why do you think they were called the sons of thunder? Do you think it was geographic, a lot of rain and thunder and lightning? <laughs> do you think they may have been of the type that were explosive, maybe even easily offended, explosive in nature? Luke chapter 9. Let's see a little more of the story. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51 In verse 51, we read a little more of their potential tra transformation they had to accomplish. In verse 51, And now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So potentially Christ and his disciples heading to Jerusalem here. Verse 53, but they did not receive him. That is the Samaritans because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Of course, we know Samaritans and the Jews were kind of at odds. Samaritans had their own twisted version of Judaism, their own center of worship. They didn't get along. Verse 54, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven? and to consume them just as Elijah did. Now here we have the sons of thunder speaking. You know, Christ, apparently the forerunners, uh, there was rejection of Christ, at least his disciples. Their reaction, who do they think they are? What an insult. Don't they know how great Jesus is? Don't they know we are his disciples? We aren't going to take it. You know, earlier in the chapter, it was Peter, James, and John who went up on the mount when he was transfigured. So possibly they had a greater sense of who they were. And they were ready to call down fire. Verse 55. But he, Jesus Christ, turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Incredible. What, don't you think? Implying Satan's influence. The spirit world. What manner of spirit you are of. Pretty strong language. James and John were highly offended. They weren't going to take this insult. It was payback time. You know, that's, that was the start. James and John started out being readily offended explosive but you know they didn't say that way the bible doesn't give us the whole story every last detail of james life but we do know he was the first apostle to be martyred and the only apostle whose death is recorded and of course james remained faithful to the end there is no evidence he was ready to call down fire at his death by king herod at that time John, the other son of thunder, was apparently the only original apostle not martyred. And he changed dramatically over time. He wrote the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He became one whom the scriptures say was the disciple that Christ loved. Think about that. He was especially close to Jesus Christ. He was one who was commonly called the apostle of love. We could say the apostle of outgoing concern. You know, years ago, a few years ago, I remember hearing uh, Dr. Meredith mention, as some of you have heard him say, that originally King David was his hero and a wholehearted in everything that King David did. But then he said later that really in recent years it became John, the apostle John his perspective, let's say, ungodly character and outgoing concern. Listen to John's words if we will, if we will turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, we are arriving spiritually because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, 
or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You no longer see a son of thunder, do you? You know, you don't see that same mindset. One who wanted to earlier fry the Samaritans. You see a different perspective. He became the apostle of Christ, ultimately, the one who truly came to understand there is no place in our character for being easily offended and confrontational and explosive. There's just no place for those who would be first fruits, firstborn. And again, we're talking about that was point number one. We can change. It's not genetic. It's not because of the environment. We're capable of change. And again, we're, t we're talking about how do we keep from being easily offended. And number two, number two, recognize that being offended is a choice. It's a choice we make. We must choose not to be easily offended. We become determined to not take offense. Now we know again Christ said offenses must come or will come. But receiving offense and taking offense are two different things. Every one of us have been slighted or wronged or overlooked at times in our life. That's undeniable. But how we respond is totally up to us. When we take offense, their problem becomes our problem. It's the way it works. You know, the classic example with a stranger, someone rudely cuts in front of us on the road and slows down. That's typical, but even among us, do we take offense? <laughs> do, do we begin to respond more aggressively? Honking, maybe yelling, waving, or do we let it pass? You know, there's times for us to kind of adjust and recognize this is not the time to demand justice, even in our own life. You know, we read the scripture earlier, great peace of they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. That was Psalm 119, verse 165. Remember also the scripture, love does not behave rudely, is not provoked, thinks no evil. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. We read that earlier. And also, the discretion, or you might say the wisdom, the maturity of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. We saw that in, in Proverbs 19, 11. Well, sometimes people are offensive, and that's a given. Sometimes people are offensive, but we don't have to take offense and respond in kind, get angry, ignore the person, avoid them at all costs. You know, that's going the opposite direction, isn't it? That's being controlled by others, controlling our response kind of like a puppet on a string. We're out of control. We don't have the maturity. We respond in kind. So we can choose to not take offense. Sometimes as difficult as that is, meaning we choose not to get even, we choose not to get bitter because we've been mistreated, mishandled, we choose not to take offense ourselves. You know, we, we have a, another agenda in our life. It's preparation for real life, for working with human beings by the thousands who maybe often are out of control, at least initially at the beginning of the millennium. And we don't take offense personally. We recognize, we understand where they're coming from, even though they're in the wrong. And we begin to show outgoing concern. They're mistaken. And we help impress on them. We're here for them. Show them a better way of life, a better future, the plan of God. We're on their side. Most perceived slights can be overlooked, can't they? I think in general, little slights, we can kind of let them go, slide off our back. But there are times in every human relationship 
when an offensive behavior needs to be addressed. That's a given. That's biblical. We don't, we don't swallow everything, do we? It begins to bother us. Sometimes we turn inward. And there are principles in Scripture about how to handle an offense that really bothers us. That brings us to point three. We're speaking of ways to keep from being easily offended. Number three, we apply Christ's instruction in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, that is when someone sins against us and we can't overlook it. It's a big deal in our life. How do we handle it? Do we swallow it at all costs? Grow angry, grow bitter, ruin a marriage? I remember years ago in taking a marriage class, an instructor was saying that some people in their marriage, they swallow one offense after another, never addressing it. It's kind of like saving stamps, and they paste that offense on their stamp book. Remember green stamps of way back when? <laughs> and they save their stamps. And a time comes when they can't take it anymore, they're ready to cash in their stamp book. They let them have it. Well, that's not really biblical, is it? That's not the way to handle offenses in marriage or on the job, even in the world. In a Christ's instruction about handling offense, generally, not in every case are people gonna respond in the right way, but in the Church of God, I think over the years, I've seen most times it works out for the better. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. Matthew 18, 15. Christ said, moreover, if your brother sins against you. You know, this is kind of a big deal. He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And the person says, yeah, I get your perspective. You know, I didn't see it that way. You're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Sometimes it happens that way. But Christ gave a brief outline, but he, in essence, we go to our brother cordially, not on attack. What happens when you, when you set somebody straight in attack mode? They always push back. It's called human nature. And typically, that's not the way I think Matthew 18 is applied here. You go to your brother, you go to your spouse, you go to your boss, and you go to him cordially. You go with an attitude of control, not an attitude, a spirit of anger, a spirit of getting even, a spirit of nailing them to the wall, you know, with a full head of steam, it's not going to be well received. It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out between husbands and wives or anyone else. So one goes, one doesn't want to be rejected. Ideally, we go to our brother or our wife or our husband or whoever, our boss, and we try to approach them calmly, trying to find a means of reaching a common ground by appreciating some aspect of that individual we're dealing with. Kind of like we were taught in uh, spokesman club, ambassador club, graduate club, where you give them a little bit of appreciation and respect up front. You don't just start out by nailing them to the wall and making them feel like a low life. That's not the, that's not the purpose. So you give them a little bit of appreciation. You start out with, you know, I appreciate this and that about you. You know, you give them something genuine, and then you say potentially, but there's one little thing that, that has bothered me, can we talk? And you know, almost always, when one approaches it that way, the other person says, okay, you know, we'll talk. And of course, it's kind of setting the other person up in a common ground scenario where they don't have to feel like they have to defend themselves right now at all costs. So when we approach someone this way, the vast majority of times they'll hear us out. It usually works, and generally, it works out for the better. We can work out the offense, the slight. Example, I remember a few years ago there was an older lady 
in one of our congregations that called me on the phone and started kind of telling me the story of her problem with some other lady. And she was offended. And I asked her, have you discussed this with so-and-so? And her response was, well, no. I would never do that. You know, that's just not me. I'm not that type. Besides, she would never hear me. And I told her at that point, you know, this is part of your training for God's family. It's illustrated in Matthew chapter 18. It's what you will be doing in the millennium if we're there. So I want you, I would like you to go to this other lady and approach her in a cordial way, compliment her about something, reach a common ground, and then and point out the one little thing that has bothered you, or maybe that has offended you, whatever the case may be. And she said, well, it's not going to work. And she said, but OK. <laughs> Everybody assumes it's not going to work. So a few weeks later, she calls me back and says, you know, I talked to this lady. And she said, amazing. It worked. <laughs> she said, uh, you know, we talk friendly, and we're OK now. It worked. You know, how often do people apply that? Why don't we apply that? Because we assume that we're going to go to the other person and attack them, nail them to the wall for their offense. But really, that's not the way to approach others, is it? We go to them in a kindly spirit, non-aggressive, appreciating them on some level, and bringing up a small issue maybe that's been bothering us. And I would say in the church, probably 80 to 90% of the time, it works out when that is applied. Not 100% but most of the time. So that's really a part of the aspect of how we keep from being readily, easily offended. In other words, we just don't swallow every fence and grow bitter. We apply scriptural approaches as Christ outlined as we will be directing human beings in the millennium. You know, people will probably come to us in the millennium and they'll start talking about somebody else and we'll probably say, did you go to the other person? And they'll say, of course not. And we will probably say, don't tell me anymore. Not until you do your part. You go to your brother or whomever, and you talk to them gently, and you bring out the offense. We'll probably begin teaching that way. Well, if we don't apply that in this life as potential first fruits, how will we ever teach this principle in the family of God? Our responsibility is to learn to apply it now, not just theory but practically. That brings me to a, another point, a final point. We're talking about not being easily offended, preventing that from overcoming us in life when offenses come. Number four, ask God for help in becoming less sensitive, easily offended, and developing a forgiving spirit. You know, oftentimes we become offended. Our pride gets in the way. We think, I'm not going to let them treat me that way. Who do they think they are? You know, I, I deserve more respect than that. And we become offended. Being sensitive and easily offended is generally a result of being preoccupied with self, isn't it? With self. How am I coming across? What do others think of me? Why am I not recognized more? Why am not, I not getting enough respect? Why aren't people more friendly to me? And on and on and on. You know, it's, it's about self. It's about feeling we're not respected and honored the way we're entitled to, being self-centered of course, is the core of human nature, wouldn't you say? Self-centered. We place ourselves first in our life, very often at the expense of others and their well-being. And that transition from self-centeredness to outgoing concern is the path of the conversion process over a lifetime. Of course, that's meaning it is over a lifetime. It doesn't happen just because we've been baptized. 
we receive God's Spirit, but that's the beginning of the process of learning, among other things, self-control, not being easily offended, a person of peace, outgoing concern, calmness, and all the other aspects that we read about how kindly spirit should be. So keeping it on the front burner and praying about it often. You know, the front, the front burner analogy, I learned that from my grandmother. You know, when you're cooking, you know, there's some things that are on the front burner, maybe a, a rolling boil, and there are other things on the back burners that kind of are on low cook, I guess, simmer. Well, it's something like this we keep on the front burner. We don't kind of put it in the background. We recognize we have a need to change. We keep it focused, asking God for help, recognizing that we can't do it alone. We ask God for help from being so sensitive and easily offended. We have to recognize that in ourselves. If we don't recognize that in ourselves, then we don't change. It's a given. But that process, keeping it on the front burner, praying about it, recognizing we need to change, helps us to make progress. If we keep that goal constantly on our mind, doesn't mean things happen quickly. But whatever is not on the front burner of our mind is not our priority. It's something in the back we're going to get around to maybe, hopefully, someday, maybe not. Front burner, in analogy, we're active with it, we take it to God, we recognize we need to change. Developing a forgiving spirit is equally a crucial aspect of becoming not easily offended. Some assume that they cannot forgive. They cannot forgive, they cannot forget an offense unless that other person comes and apologizes. Of course, that's the ideal, isn't it? Somebody comes, Matthew 18, or they recognize it, and they apologize, and we feel good about it. We rebuild our relationship. But, you know, in some cases, that's not going to happen. Somebody coming to us and apologizing, somebody who's been offensive. But Scripture, I think, is very clear that we must have a forgiving spirit even when there is no apology. Now, some people might uh, think otherwise, but I think, you know, in reality, when humans forgive, it means release, let go. None of us have the capacity to wipe out somebody's sins. It's only repentance, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But psychologically, realistically, we have the capacity, I think of it as human forgiveness of letting go. I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm not going to let their problem be my problem. I'm going to let it go. That's a type of forgiveness we're capable of. You know the example of Stephen when he was being stoned? That's one obvious example. Look at, his, look at his attitude, his mindset in the book of Acts chapter 7. Here he was being persecuted, stoned, executed. He was, he was attacked as you know, with spite and anger and hate. Verse 55. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. Speaking of Stephen, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, reaching that level of maturity, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice. They couldn't take it. And stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. So they were just so overcome uh, and angry with the spirit of hate. Verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
You know, obviously, God will hold them responsible for this sin. They're going to have to repent. They're going to come up in a second resurrection. They're going to have to surrender and repent for this sin. There, there will be need for repentance. But Stephen wasn't going to die bitter. That's kind of a, the point here in his maturity. He was simply asking God to not hold it against, against them, you know, potentially, I assume, maybe in this life. It is going to be held against them in the resurrection. They are going to have to repent. But Stephen recognized they were ignorant. Part of it was ignorance. But, of course, hypocrisy was a part of it as well. And, of course, we know the same principle was demonstrated as Christ was being executed. The exact same principle. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34. And again, God will hold them responsible to their sin, to their murder, in a future resurrection, a second resurrection. There will be a need for repentance at that time. But obviously Christ was not going to die bitter as a human being. And he expressed that in his final sentiments. I think what, what an example. There was no repentance at that time. But he didn't hold that bitterness you know, in, in his heart, he died guiltless. You and I have many choices to make in life. We can choose to live a life of being easily offended, of having an overly sensitive nature, unforgiving and holding grudges with every perceived slight, with a hair-trigger emotional state, goes along with it. In the end, if that is the case, we'll have a less peaceful and happy life and ultimately become less useful to the great God and his family in this, in this age and also potentially in the millennium if we're there. Or, you know, life is full of chooses, choices. We can choose to live a life not easily offended with an overly sensitive nature but forgiving, not prone to hold grudges, overlooking most perceived slights, and in the end enjoying a more peaceful and happy life, and far more useful to the great God himself in this life and in the family of God and the kingdom of God to come. I think the best summary is found in Psalms we read earlier. Great peace have they which love your law and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, verse 165. Do we have that kind of peace in our life? Do we want that kind of peace in our life? And nothing shall offend us. In other words, growing bitter, wanting to get even, wanting to get back, refusing to talk, refusing to communicate. We're not going to go that route as future sons of God. So in conclusion, brethren, Let's dedicate ourselves to being not easily offended. You know, that's a challenge. That's a lifetime challenge. It takes effort. It's a choice. It takes maturity. It takes growth. But that is our calling to be firstborn sons of God.